everybody here. I'm um, I'm Nick Poole. I'm chief executive at SILIP, and it's been an absolute pleasure working with Jane and Annalise and, and colleagues uh, in the establishment of, of this really, really important uh, alliance program of work uh, initiative that we're leading together. Uh, so welcome to today's launch webinar for the Media and Information Literacy uh, Alliance. This is an incredibly important and a very timely initiative, and I am really, really pleased that SILIP and the Information Literacy Group have been able to work together to bring it to life. Uh, and hopefully from today's seminar, you'll go away uh, both fully informed about what we're doing, but also hopefully inspired to get involved uh, and help us shape the programme as it goes forward from here. Uh, so why now, why this? Uh, I think it's Tracy D. Hall, uh, who's the counterpart, my counterpart director at the American Libraries Association, said recently, information access is the defining civil rights issue of our time. And media and information literacy are central to addressing, uh, I think, both the potential harms of the digital landscape that we're all living in, uh, but also to maximizing the potential for new forms of public good. And I think as we've explored the landscape of media and information literacy, we've really found that uh, making the scale of change that's needed uh, isn't the work of any one organization. It, it doesn't sit with uh, any one of us. It's a central challenge, I think, across the whole ecosystem of the public and third sector, professional bodies, libraries, uh, and um, really everyone who believes that we can come together to help people lead happier, healthier, healthier and safer digital and online lives. So what we're doing and what we're hoping to do with the Alliance um, is to bring together people, organizations, grassroots groups, uh, anyone who shares that vision and ambition uh, to create something that makes a real and lasting difference in the media and information literacy landscape. So today, uh, absolutely delighted, I'm going to hand to Jane and Annalise in a moment who are going to talk us through uh, the Alliance, uh, how we're approaching it and, and this framework that's being developed for it uh, and then it's going to come back to me and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, next steps and, and the work plan that goes alongside it. Uh, so hopefully that's enough by way of introduction. Can I hand over to you Jane and Annalise to talk us through Mila? Yes, excellent. Thank you Nick, thanks. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Hopefully the echo um, is better that uh, somebody mentioned in the chat a moment ago. Um, I'm delighted to um, be speaking to you um, today about the Media and Information Literacy Alliance and the framework that we've been developing. So I'm um, the chair of the SILIP Information Literacy Group and um, I'm going to be um, leading this presentation with Annalise Hardin, who is the deputy chair um, of the group um, on an acting basis um, at the moment. Um, so uh, many of you, I'm quite sure, um, are probably members of the SILIP Information Literacy Group. You know, you don't need any uh, introduction to who we are. I'm sure uh, I see many familiar faces of people who've been at our LILAC conference as well. Um, but if you don't know um, us, then we're one of the special interest groups of SILIP, uh, one of the largest special interest groups, but cross-sectoral, um, so uh, interested in information literacy in all sorts of different contexts, not just the academic com context. Um, and I think one of the things that we've been thinking um, for some time is um, how important information literacy is, but how potentially overlooked it sometimes is. And so it's been a kind of real challenge that we've been talking about um, even going back four or five years at the LILAC conference about how we make information literacy mainstream. And I hope that at the moment we, we potentially have a real opportunity to do that. And I'm not, um, I, you know, I'm also very well aware that that is hugely challenging as well. Um, just very quickly, um, I think if we could have the next slide, um, Annalise would just like to um, see if you can Tell us a bit about information literacy now and why it matters. Annalise, are you going to just speak to this slide? Yeah, so just to get us started, to put ourselves in the right frame of mind, we would like you to share with us in the chat what information literacy is and why it does matter in your own words, please. So just type it in the chat. I'm going to do a bit of PowerPoint wizardry so you can, uh, so you can see the visual timer here um, and see how much time you've got left. So in the chat, please, what is information literacy and why does it matter? 
why does it matter now as well? <laughs> <laughs> See who can be the quickest off the mark there with uh, uh, writing something concise, which is always a challenge um, when talking about information literacy. <laughs> We're not allowed to quote the ILG definition. You can if you want, David. <laughs> Just make sure to attribute. <laughs> Oh, we've got some great stuff coming already. I doubt stuff. That's always a good one. I like the fact that Liz says it means different things in different contexts. So no one <laughs> definition is meaningful to us all. That makes it an impossible challenge. <laughs> That's it. That's a minute gone. Thank you so much. Oh, keep them coming. Yeah. OK, if I can have my next slide. Yeah, thanks. So um, information literacy is an area I've worked in for the, uh, a huge part of my career in, in libraries and now working um, as a lecturer in educational development. Um, and for me, um, the kind of light bulb moment, I guess, about why information literacy was way more than just about helping people find and use information in a library context was reading UNESCO's Alexandria Proclamation um, that was issued in 2005, seems like a very long time ago, but is, um, I think, still a massively powerful statement when it says how information literacy lies at the core of lifelong learning. Um, and it talks about how information literacy empowers people um, and also, I think, makes the point that information literacy is something that's valuable to help you achieve whatever your, your goals are, personal, social, occupational and educational. So that lie um, at the heart of, I guess, why the information literacy um, in around 2017 decided that we wanted to look at the SILIP definition of information literacy. Um, Many of you will, um, and as, as David said, you know, that that's the kind of the, the definition that many people will probably draw on now um, if we're thinking, well, what is information literacy? If I can just have the, the next slide. Um, Annalise, thanks. So we did um, a, a lot of work when we were pulling together our definition of information literacy. This is our kind of highest level statement um, that we wrote um, about, you know, I think trying to um, express some of what was also in the Alexandria Proclamation more accurately. So that when people um, were saying, well, this is what information literacy means today, um, they, they were you know, thinking in, in quite an aspirational way, I think, about information literacy, thinking about something also um, that potentially was empowering as well. Um, if I can have the next slide. Um, we also did quite a lot of work in 2018 to um, recognise that information literacy was contextual. Um, we picked five contexts where we explored what information literacy meant. So health, education, the workplace, citizenship and democracy, and then everyday life. And um, I think um, that that work that we did at the time was massively helpful. But one of the things um, that I'm very aware that we didn't ever get around to doing is to turn that into some sort of framework, turn it into something practical that we could use um, and, and, and particularly um, the information professionals could use. Um, and that is something that, that through this new work we've been doing um, on the Media and Information Literacy Alliance, I'm really pleased that we could kind of go back and, and sort of finish off what we started back in 2018. So next slide, please. So the Media and Information Literacy Alliance, you may well have heard about the Alliance. Um, it's something um, where we've um, been working on this um, over the summer. Um, it's a collaboration at the moment between SILIP and the Information Literacy Group. Um, although in August, we held a meeting with um, around 30 stakeholders and people from all sorts of different organizations who joined us, um, who were interested in participating in this alliance. Um, what we've done at this stage is we've written a purpose, vision and mission for the Alliance. So you can see those 
um, up on the screen. Um, and um, we are um, continuing to sort of recruit people to be part of the Alliance, um, to come together. And Nick's gonna tell you a bit about some of the additional work that we hope to do. Um, why now, I suppose? Um, next slide, please. I mean, I think all of us are very aware um, about the concerns that there have been around misinformation, particularly during the pandemic, but obviously this has been a, an ongoing issue um, with a focus particularly on fake news, disinformation, um, and um, I think, you know, media and information literacy is, is one key way um, to help us address some of these, what, what are sometimes called online harms. So it's not the only solution. I'm very well aware there's a lot of work that um, needs to be done around pr platform regulation as well. But I do think that, that equipping people with the abilities um, to, to deal with information in all the forms that they find it can really help them um, in the digital age. Um, and one of the things on this slide that we wanted to emphasize really was that we don't see this as something that you can just fix kind of in one part of society. So um, obviously thinking about schools and thinking about what young people learn and the skills that they develop um, while they're going through the school system is, is hugely important. But I think that it's really missing a trick to think that that's the only place where we need interventions. So we see that media and information literacy is something that runs right through society at all different levels, um, whether people are in the workplace, whether they're not in the workplace, whether whether we're talking about young people, whether we're talking about older people. And that's what we've tried to reflect um, in working on the Alliance and working on the framework. And what that means is that we will be particularly looking to partner with people um, and organizations to help us um, tackle media and information literacy in all those different areas. Because I, I think librarians, we, we cut across many of these sectors, but there will be specific organizations that we need to help us. So I just want to say something um, about the kind of really pertinent point about why now as well. Um, and, and that relates, yes, if I can have my next slide, um, that relates to a specific government publication that came out in July 2021. Um, if you haven't seen it, then I think um, I would highly recommend you have a look at the, the um, DCMS Online Media Literacy, Literacy Strategy. It was published in July 2021, um, and we've got a link in our slides. Um, I think Annalise should be able to pop that into the chat for me. Um, it came out of a lot of um, different white papers and government inquiries into um, online harms. So um, there is um, quite a focus on um, keeping people safe when they're online, but actually for the first time um, we see in a government um, strategy, we, we see librarians recognised, so they are mentioned as being a key player um, in helping people develop media literacy. And also we see the phrase information literacy appearing as well in these reports. And so it's, it's, it's you know, really exciting actually, but it's also a real opportunity, I think, to, to, to kind of wave the flag and to, to be very clear about the role that librarians play. Um, Annalise, I think at this point, I'm gonna hand over to you. Yeah. Yes, because there is another key piece of legislation that is worth mentioning at this point that does mention uh, media and information literacy, and that's the draft online safety bill that was included in the Queen's speech in May this year. So the government said that the draft bill would protect freedom of expression, but there are a lot of critics that remain unconvinced. This draft online safety bill is currently being scrutinized by a joint committee of both the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And this, the committee has already taken uh, evidence from key witnesses. So we have seen the Facebook whistleblowers, Francis Haugen and Sophie Jang, uh, just this week and last week. Um, but they're also going to meet in the coming weeks, uh, the head, some heads at Facebook, some heads from TikToks, as well as some, the, some of the uh, Ofcom directors to produce some recommendations to the government. And so far, the evidence shown concerned with harms by design, financial harm as well, and a reluctance in taking ownership. So the report and the recommendation will be published by the 10th of December. So that's something that we're gonna keep a close eye on, of course. 
So what do the public think about information literacy? Really early on uh, in our thinking we're in ILG, we uh, thought about the impact that we wanted to have and what we wanted to achieve. And we knew that we wanted, we wanted above all to for the, uh, the intervention to be meaningful to most people in our society so that we could make a marked difference. So we needed to know what the public understood in media and information literacy to be and know how they formulated that in their own words. So the information literacy group carried out interviews with uh, family, with friends, with colleagues, all of the people around us for two weeks and uh, we analysed the results with Jane. And you can see on this slide uh, three examples that we felt really encapsulated this really well. There's some strong elements that came through which show us that the people we spoke to understood information literacy and what being information literate meant. And it really called back to the definition that Jane discussed earlier as well. So they knew that information literacy is about the information we find and that we use when they say um, to be able to access information that you can use in your everyday life. They understood that information literacy allows you to engage fully with society uh, with the quote on the left that says being able to communicate and interact fully with people. And they also spoke of thinking criti critically. So, for example, when they say not to assume that what you're being told is completely accurate. So they had it right. And when we talked to all of these people uh, we surveyed, we also wanted to understand from them why they found media and information literacy valuable. And they were able to articulate some really broad and critical notions like this is what life is about or this is how you interact with people. They could see some clear benefits as well when they say it helps reach informed decision. But they could also see the dangers of not being media and information literate. So when they say being misled and potentially taken advantage of, um, like absorb someone else's opinion. So as sample, we really, they were also able to relate how media and information literacy came into play in different areas of their life um, and how we impacted them deeply, which leads us logically to how we developed our framework. So that's to you, Jane. Yes, thank you, Annalise. Yeah, so um, developing this framework was really um, a, a framed around um, doing something a bit different, I think, because what you might think is, well, why do we need another framework? There's many information, digital media literacy frameworks that are out there. But I think um, building on the work that we've done earlier with the, the definition, how it applied in different contexts, we really felt that many of the existing frameworks are quite academic in the way that they addressed information information literacy specifically. Um, so what we were looking for was to do something that would actually be meaningful in people's daily lives. Um, and we decided to base this around um, these kind of aspirations of what people might want for themselves and for others to have these kind of happier, healthier, safe safer lives. Um, we also thought that the framework would be particularly useful for work that we were going to do in terms of building partnerships with organisations, particularly outside of formal education. It would help us with research and evidence gathering. Um, we're particularly interested on um, the the impact that information literacy has and are going to be very soon commissioning um, a systematic review in that area. Um, and we thought that it would really help us having this framework that was written in this kind of everyday language with a communication, with advocacy and to build some of our campaigns on. So I'm delighted to be able to um, present to you a sort of very high level overview of the framework today. Um, Annalise, if we can just go to the next slide and I'm just going to pop into the chat where you can find the framework online um, if you because I'm, I'm very aware that today you will want to spend a bit of time um, afterwards looking at this. Um, the aspirations that, that we've created um, as part of this framework 
um, are to be informed. And, and, and if you look at the graphic here, be informed is actually represented by that blue light bulb in the middle of the screen. And I think being informed, we, when Annalise and I just a few weeks ago were talking about this, we realised this is the absolute kind of core of, of what information literacy is about. It's the words that people use about being informed. Um, and everything else in many ways hangs off that. So um, it, it helps with, you know, people then becoming informed empowered if they're informed it helps them keep themselves healthy it helps with being socially conscious um, and the role that they play within their community and communities and it helps them um, be connected so I'm going to hand back to Annalise and we're going to do a bit of a double act here um, to talk you through each of those different aspirations in a little bit more detail yeah so there's a bit of to me to you that's going to happen here <laughs> But we're starting with what these aspirations actually mean for people. What do, do the people need to be able to do to achieve these aspirations or at least be on their way? So we try to crystallize what the aspiration means as simply and succinctly as possible. So here's our attempt. Um, being informed means people can find trustworthy information, they can fact check it, they can make sense of it. And as Jane said, it's the core of the whole framework and it reflects across all of the aspirations. So it's an umbrella aspiration really. Being empowered means people can make the right decision for their personal and professional development, um, as well as being able to support those around them. And I felt it was, we felt it was crucial to emphasize that it's not just about self-development but also our impact on others and the care we put in elevating our fellow human beings. Be healthy is being able to find reliable health information to make decisions to manage your own health and again those of others. Be socially conscious is all about community and how you can use information to make a positive impact around you. And finally, be connected means you can evaluate and choose the right online services and information effectively and responsibly. Um, so when we first started thinking about developing the framework, we knew we wanted to achieve something that people around us would understand that they could relate to. And as a group of information practitioners in different sectors, we interact with a wide variety of people from all walks of life uh, in different spheres and all the time. So we know exactly what issues they're encountering and what sort of problems they're trying to solve. So these really concrete examples, they form the solid base for the framework and they allowed us to think more broadly about what each of these aspirations meant in day-to-day -day life. So with Be Informed, we thought about different examples. So a teenager, for example, following celebrities on Instagram, showcasing different products, what does it mean? Do they generally recommend those products or have they been paid to advertise and generate an income from their followers? It could be a friend giving you a leaflet about their church when you might be going through some tough times in your personal life. How would you go about checking that it's not a cult? Or finding an interesting article on Facebook, resharing it with friends without checking the claims. Um, how do you fact check it before resharing? And another one, which I'm sure most of us have experienced, which is finding unbiased information about contested and difficult current issues like conflicts in the Middle East. So that's to you, Jane. Thanks, Annalise. Sorry, seamless. I was just unmuting. Um, so, yeah, what we've also done then to build on that for each of the aspirations, um, and you will see this if you, you uh, go to look at the framework um, in more detail afterwards, um, is that we've written things that people will understand um, for each of these aspirations. Now, I'm not going to go through each of these um, uh, because I would like you to read them and, and also to, to give us a sense of whether these are correct you know this is still a draft framework so um if you see something and you think mm, that doesn't quite 
that's not quite worded right please do let us know but we've said about what does be informed mean well what does it mean that that you can understand so i can understand that information has value and purpose we're very aware that value is very loaded as well but it means that people can understand that not all information is reliable or accurate and it also means that they can recognize where some people have expertise we felt this was really important to say that there are um, experts in some fields but also that many subjects are very complex and open to interpretation so it's not just a matter of kind of fact checking you know you've got to kind of do a bit more than that because you know there will be many sides to to some of the the kind of particularly contested areas and then what we've done is we've written quite concrete things that it means if you are informed what sorts of things can you do so this is I guess a little bit about the sort of skills and the sort of behavior um, and and it's about you know checking the authorship of information finding out you know knowing what the difference is between mis and disinformation um, deciding what it is about particular authors or experts that gives them authority etc um, as I say I won't go through all of these um, but this is really to sort of show you that building upon those kind of everyday um, examples, um, we've we've built something that we hope um, might start to look a little bit like um, a sort of uh, a more traditional framework, a kind of curriculum or something. Annalise. With Be Empowered, we're looking at examples from across sectors such as an individual who's unsure on how to protect themselves from mean comments on blogs, someone wanting to register to vote, finding the right link and the guidance. Um, so looking at citizenship here, someone having uh, shared some thoughts about a colleague on Facebook and worried that they may be, might be found out. Uh, and a powerful example, I think right now, a visitor to the public library looking at how to reduce energy payments by switching but not knowing their rights or how to shop around. So once again, um, we've written statements about what, what are the sorts of things we'd expect someone to be able to understand. Um, a, a lot in this framework about being responsible, again, another kind of potentially loaded term, but recognising that people are both users and creators of information and also um, that they are informed as a consumer but also as a citizen as well. Um, we've also got something in here recognizing um, about you know, caring for your own mental health and making informed decisions. And then through the kind of sort of skills that we see, the things that people can do, being empowered does um, relate to things like you know, understanding how to change privacy settings, being able to make comparisons um, on websites between prices and uh, different sites offering all sorts of offers and working out what reviews are genuine um, and also being able to distinguish between um, harmful content as well and to change sort of settings and things that 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 might um, avoid you know being triggered by some of that I say I won't I won't go through all of those but be empowered um, is is um, a, a really really important kind of key sort of aspect I think of information literacy. So next we're going to be healthy and I'm sure that there's something that um, will speak to all of us in the current circumstances and for this we're really grateful to our colleagues at, in the uh, health libraries group who were able to lend their support to us. Uh, so we looked at examples such as being prescribed new medication, being unsure around the terminology in the leaflet and the side effects, being unclear about the values of a blood test such as diabetes and not know risk, knowing the risk you uh, might be facing. Similarly, uh, there's been some uncertainty around BMI calculation. So how would you know if you need to lose weight really based solely on the values um, and the numerical values? Um, and finally, the example of a pregnant person, not knowing if the information they saw on Facebook are true or how to check it if and um, if indeed the information is sound and based on scientific evidence. Yes, so um, again, sort of the things that people would understand around being healthy, um, health information, obviously all information is, is complex, but health information is particularly complex and it can change frequently. It's, you know, health information does need to be based 
on current evidence. Um, and we've worked, as, as Annalise said, very closely with um, the Health Libraries Group on these statements to tie this in with the work that they're doing around health literacy. So it's got, again, some very clear skills and abilities, things that people can do, that they can break down the information they need, that they can find um, the purpose and bias of health information particularly, um, and um, that they can you know, check that information is up to date, things like that. Be socially conscious really emphasizes what I touched on earlier, the idea of yourself as part of the community um, and social consciousness and responsibility. So we chose some example based on ecological impacts, such as finding out about the chemicals in your laundry detergents and their impact on the environment. Uh, examples around the inclusivity and inclusive requirements, such as finding out how to make a community center more accessible for wheelchair users. Uh, we also choose to, uh, to have an example around um, allyships and knowing what it means and how to educate yourself and how to be a good ally. Uh, and also conspiracy, misinformation and disinformation and how to talk to others about it. Yes, yeah, so in terms of the sorts of things that you can understand around being socially conscious, that you're accountable for the information that you share, that you're responsible for your online actions and any real life consequences that they have, um, and that you are recognised as well that you have your own um, biases. There's something in here around also um, using, reusing and sharing content fairly and ethically and being respectful and considerate to others online. So um, we've got some really kind of cl clear skills about, you know, what sorts of things um, people are able to do here, cross-referencing information, um, checking the way that they write when they, uh, you know, um, posting perhaps on an online forum, um, assessing information against their own biases um, and understanding about, you know, reusing images and pictures, for example, they might find on social media, those sorts of things. Be connected is this aspiration that really brings in the digital literacy more strongly into the framework, even though it's weaved in throughout. And here we've got examples uh, such as signing up for online banking. Where would you start? How do you make sure that uh, you protect your personal information and your financial data, uh, applying for jobs, and hiding social media, making online purchases, how to get the, to get the best deal, I know that's one of my favourites, uh, and using reviews, uh, but also handling microtransactions in gaming. Um, again, some of the things that you understand around um, being connected, that online information is visible to all, um, the value of your, your, your personal data and the need to keep it secure, um, and also something around um, the value of um, collective knowledge in communities as well, which um, we, we did some work just actually in the last week to really try to kind of make sure we had that, that aspect of it correct. Um, so the sorts of things that people can do um, is obviously finding information, um, but also um, knowing what's sort of at the appropriate level of information to share on online platforms, checking about consent, um, you know, and, and understanding around uh, passwords and things like that to really kind of keep your personal data um, safe um, and, um, you know, being able to evaluate um, and use community generation, generated information appropriately. Because we're very aware, particularly, you know, in some areas of, around health, for example, that going on to community forums can actually be really, really valuable, but potentially community information needs to be used, I think, quite cautiously. So that is our framework. Um, if you want to find out more, we're also really delighted that the uh, the new Media and Information Literacy Alliance website has now um, gone live with our, our logo and um, some further information about how you can get involved um, if you're um, wanting to kind of, I, I've seen a, a number of people um, who, who may well want to sign up to the Alliance or talk to us further. We're going to allow some time um, at the end of this session. We've got scheduled 15 minutes for discussion, but obviously this is just the start of our conversations. But really excited to, I guess, formally launch uh, the, the Media and Information Literacy Alliance today. And please do check out the website and the framework 
um, and get in touch with us. So if I could just have the final slide, I think, um, then uh, really, oh, no, I'm going to Nick to now. Yes, uh, apologies. Yes, <laughs> I think that that was my final slide. Yeah, it was. You've got a fantastic final slide coming up, Jane, but I, I, I think you wanted me to talk a little bit about the work plan and, and what happened Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. Yes, Nick. Um, Back to you. Yes. So I'll, I'll, I've just got a couple of slides where I thought it'd be useful for us to set out where we're at now, where we're going next, and, and hopefully how people can get involved. So we're in phase one right now. That's uh, really this year. Uh, the first step was to start to build the alliance, and I, I, I can show you who's involved in the conversation so far in just a moment. Um, we wanted to create an identity. I've just seen a brilliantly timely comment from Liz Parcell coming in uh, about the graphic and the identity. We, we really, really want to use this uh, to cut through and to have a conversation about how can we make a genuine difference uh, in a very practical way to people's online lives. Um, we've started to build some of the partnerships. I've seen, as you say, Jane, a couple of people coming into the chat here. Uh, love to get the patient information forum involved, I have to say that, that would be fantastic. Um, but also, you know, th th there is a real common belief. So uh, one of the things that's been a challenge for all of us, I think, for a long time is that information literacy has been a preserve of our professional discourse. It has undoubtedly crossed over into the mainstream now. It's in legislation. People are talking about it. Um, there is a real opportunity for us to get involved. Uh, the website is live, which is great. A really good step to, to sort of establish the presence. Um, I have to just a huge round of applause to, to Jane and, and Annalise and colleagues for the framework, because I, I think it genuinely does create something fresh and new and compelling as an articulation of media and information literacy. Um, the next step then, as, as Jane alluded to, is we want to undertake a systematic review uh, to look at the evidence base. One, one of the key conversations in media and information literacy is about impact and measurement and so we want to be part of that conversation about um you know what, what do we understand at the moment what do we need to develop where do we uh, where do we need to create new concepts and, and resources uh, and then literally at the moment developing the work plan going to be sharing that back with the alliance uh, before christmas bringing the stakeholders back together going into phase two uh, we want to continue to snowball to kind of bring people on board. Um, SILIP members have funded the work so far, for which many thanks. Uh, um, so we've been able to use membership fees to pay for the, the design, the website and, and the systematic review. Um, but we want to also raise funds to do uh, projects, um, uh, investigations, research and, and so on. We definitely want to cut through to the public with this. So there will be a public campaign around Mila um, sort of the first half of next year. Uh, we also need to sit down with some of those policy makers. So, for example, uh, Lord uh, Clement Jones, who's the chair of the scrutiny panel for the government's online uh, safety strategy, contacted us a, a few days ago and is inviting us to come and meet and talk to them. We need to continue that dialogue with policy makers uh, and then to go into longer term planning for this really, really important initiative. Then finally, phase three, looking ahead to the next couple of years, really, we want to continue to build and to grow. To continue to deliver, we need very practical outcomes from this uh, ongoing communications with the wider world and ongoing government liaison. So that's that's kind of what we're working on at the moment. If I could go on to the next slide, please. Brilliant. Um, so just some of the names, some of the people that are in the dialogue already. Uh, obviously, SILIP and Information Literacy Group uh, working together. We've been uh, talking to the Guardian Foundation. Um, very pleased to have NHS Health Education England. Uh, engaged uh, particularly in the, the sort of be healthy proposition alongside the health libraries group. Uh, Impress, uh, the, the press and media, media regulator, uh, what I used to know as the Workers' Education Authority, but now the WEA, uh, looking at the impact of adult learning on media and information literacy. Uh, talking to the team at, at DCMS around the media uh, literacy strategy. Uh, we've got a really positive conversation with Wikimedia UK about there engagement. Uh, we've been talking to Ofcom's Making Sense of, of Media, where we're represented by Stefan uh, Goldstein, who I know is on, on the call today, um, about how we can align our work. And also um, just looking at the alignment with the National Literacy Trust's News Literacy Network as well. So just making sure we're being a good partner in the landscape. Um, conversations with UK Parliament around their work. Uh, the existing relationship between Information Literacy Group and Teen Tech, 
uh, some interest from NewsGuard uh, around some of the resources and support they're already directing into libraries. Uh, we've got the SLA, School Library Association, and our own school libraries group as well. I, th I think school librarians are going to be very fundamentally important partners in all of this. Uh, and then some great emerging um, partnership and participation from academic partners, so particularly Manchester Metropolitan, but also University of Bristol, University of Sheffield, the Aga Khan University as well, I, I know is involved. So, you know, th this is starting to become something really exciting. It, it's starting to become something that has uh, a real opportunity, I think, to position our profession in relation to this media and information literacy landscape. Uh, so if we could go on to the next slide, please. Uh, so just in terms of uh, what we need to ask of you, um, there is a sign up form on the Mila website uh, at that URL. It would be fantastic if you're not already, if you could um, go there, let us know who you are. And I think there's an option both to, to sign up to receive information, but also to signal if you're keen to be more directly involved and to help us with uh, the work and the development of Mila. Love to hear your ideas, helping to shape the work plan and the implementation. You know that this is uh, not something we're leading. I think it's something we're supporting and enabling, and we'd love to get the best ideas uh, from the community about how to take it forward. Uh, but also, we would love to grow it from here. This is very much the launch uh, for Mila within the sector. We're also going to be sharing it with the wider world. But it would be great if you could share it with your networks. Ask your organisation to consider getting involved. Uh, Liz, it would be fantastic if you could share it with the GISC community as well and um, generally we want this thing to grow to get legs to build momentum and then to make a real difference to people's lives um, so I believe then I, I think am I handing back to you Jane and, and Annalise for yes that's right time? yes yes yeah thanks Nick yeah that that was really I think where I wanted to lead it we're we are um yes we are recording today and we will be um happy for people to share the recording we'll make that available um for people who weren't able to attend but I I, I think you know this this does feel to me like a really kind of um pivotal moment I think um I, I'm as I said at the start I'm I'm very aware of the the challenges that we've faced with trying to get information literacy as something that is um, in in everyday people's kind of focus and attention but I, I do think the time is right to do this I think um, the the the, th the concerns that there have been um, during the pandemic particularly around misinformation and who to trust mean that this could potentially be our biggest opportunity and particularly I think because of the work that's happening in the UK government um, with which seem to share our concern so I just want to leave you um, with um, a, a quote that I always find um, really inspiring this sort of you know fear of failure is often the thing that holds us back and um, you know you ask what if I fail uh, what if I fall but um, my, my darling what if you fly so I'm going to uh, if we can just have our final slide um, with uh, some links there and I think we've got um, a bit more than 15 minutes for some questions um, so I'm wondering um, if we at this point yeah if we stop sharing and um, if people are happy to for the recording to carry on then I think it would be useful to have the questions recorded but obviously if if you if you aren't if there's something please let us know afterwards um, and we can edit that recording so the floor is yours um, please do yeah I was gonna say pop your hand up if you want to ask anything um, and I can see um Kay um Ecclestone you've got your hand up immediately so yeah come on the chat please love to hear from you thank you um I've just um do it straight away while I remember I have two questions what well, uh, firstly thank you this is absolutely brilliant I've been um 30 plus years in librarianship most of which was in education and I've spent a huge amount of my time with information and media literacy and I'm really pleased and I agree this is a great opportunity I've got two questions is there going to be a way of using the small impact assessments that doubtless happen across libraries? So lots of us, particularly in education, but also in public libraries, have been measuring the impact of our information literacy um, initiatives. And is there going to be a way of bringing any of that data together? Because else, it, I always think it's sort of sitting there being slightly wasted in various places. And then the second one is, is there going to be a plan to offer a an easy standardized way of measuring the impact of 
what we're doing. They're both that- really, no, no, they're both really, really good questions, actually. Um, and um, we certainly are thinking about we've been we talked um, in the early sort of meetings that we held, Nick, didn't we, about an impact framework and developing something um, along those lines. Um, I um, I think feeding in the sort of small scale evidence, you know, actually it sounds something, you know, vitally important that we need to be doing. Building up the evidence base is, is something we're very keen to do. So at the moment, no, we haven't got a mechanism for doing that, but watch this space because you know and if you want to get involved um in that k as well then we'd love to hear your ideas about how we can do that um i saw pam's hand go up pam mckinney from sheffield and i don't know if you wanted to say something in relation to that pam or if it's a separate question but um please do chip in because i know um that some of our colleagues in the um lis schools in the i schools are, are involved in the forum um, on information literacy, and I know that could well tie in very nicely with work you're thinking of doing. Hi, um, Pam. Hi, hi. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that was what I was going to really highlight was just the the focus on on research, which is obviously um, the main interest of the the forum on information literacy, and kind of um, we're really keen to think about ways that we can draw on the expertise of the information literacy practitioner community, um, and also then think about ways that we can generate you know, new research. So we're really interested, obviously, in working with uh, the Mila uh, team on thinking about the research agenda for information literacy and how we can um, really bring that to the fore. Um, so I was thinking, I was just going to ask, really, what were your um, ideas or plans if you have any at the moment about that aspect of the work I, yeah um nick if you want to respond to anything as well please please do but i mean i i think in the first instance pam the, the systematic review i'm not sure if you've you've heard about that work that we're doing but i i think that will sort of kick off, off a group then that will want to work with the the forum for information literacy on you know potentially the sort of research agenda and i think you know i see um that the alliance having a number of um working groups that we'll need to set up um and i think that it would be you know something um that we you know we, we kind of need to just start a conversation about how's that going to work in practice what we're going to do and and obviously you know we need lots and lots of people involved but we don't want to duplicate effort so if there's already your expertise and work going on there then yeah absolutely we want to work with you and support you in any way we can and we have you know opportunities i think through the lilac conference as well and all, all sorts of um possibilities but um I, I think carrying out more research is also vitally important. Absolutely. Yes. And, and trying as well to work collaboratively so that we can potentially get, you know, some decent funding from research councils or other organisations. Uh, Stefan's been doing quite a lot of work looking at um, organisations that might potentially fund research in this area. Nick or Annalise, do you want to say anything? Um, otherwise, I... Yeah, yeah. Just, just briefly. I mean, I... Absolutely. And I think this has to be inclusive and, and expansive. You know, I think what we're talking about with media and information literacy is, is an entire system change. It's a whole ecosystem problem. And so, you know, it isn't which organisations, it's every organisation, it's every community fundamentally. And, and so I think this is us partly putting a marker down for saying this is really, really important. And we'd like to add our, our support and our resources and capacity to that that push. I think then building bridges, creating partnerships, learning from what, what's out there and then sort of making a common difference. I think the other question that's been sort of plaguing me for, for a while now is the, the practical difference question is, is, okay, given the sort of shared belief in the importance of the agenda, what are the practical things you're going to do as a professional community that will make an impact on people's lives? And I think that's a key part of the work plan for us is, um, you know, what's the toolkit, what's the training, what's the project, what's the delivery, what's the activity that means people are going to be equipped with uh, those skills. And so we're really ex- excited about having some of those conversations and saying, do we know what works? What can we uh, train and equip and support our profession with so that it's not just everybody believes this is important, but we're creating real and, and measurable impact on the ground? 
Thanks, Nick. Um, shall we go over to Gary, who's got his hand up um, with a question? Yeah. Just congratulations. Uh, it's very exciting to hear the work you're doing. There's just one thing. I know it's going to be embedded in the work stream somewhere, but the whole notion of uh, inequality of access in the UK to information, it, it seems a bit understated. Ob obviously, the pandemic did result, particularly in schools and FE, where many, many pupils were disenfranchised, essentially, because they simply didn't have the, the hardware and the software and the access. Yeah. Um, so th this is laudable and very, very important, but uh, will we make it clear about how we do interface with government and parliament around some of these issues? But I think also, you know, increasing the digital access to government information, increasing access to things like benefits and stuff like that, they're all fairly fundamental issues. And without dragging the group into, you know, sort of a political fray, how are we going to ensure that that isn't ignored because many people will take a step back and say well it's all very well but you know my half my family can't even afford a, a laptop mm. yeah i think i think we're very mindful of those issues around digital exclusion um and i think in our, our meeting in august we did talk a bit about whether um, the sort of digital literacy, but also access um, to technology was was emphasised enough in the framework. So I think um, we'd certainly be, I, I feel it probably fits in the be connected um, mm. sort of field, but, but maybe it does need to be stated more explicitly. There's, I think there's, there's absolutely, you know, we're, we're presenting this to you very much as, um, the, as good as we can get it, but we know that it needs to be out there and, and have many people scrutinize it to make it more robust as well. So Gary, if you, you know, if that's something that you, you know, you think you'd like to work with us on, or if you, you know, just, we'll just take that on board and, and look at how we could address that um, in, in the kind of the framework as it stands at the moment, because I think, I think it kind of is in there, but I agree with you that it probably doesn't come through. Yeah, and great piece of work, great piece of work. You know, thank you thanks thanks it's such a crucial point as well i think that you're completely right to bring and the framework at the moment is in a sort of it's a final draft basically so we're really looking forward to receiving more feedback um when and at the same time it was a really difficult exercise to not to try and over bloat the framework if that makes sense because yeah. it, it carries the risk of you know bringing in a lot of notions and um it's also a very fine political uh line to tread um so thank you so much for bringing it up i'll make a note of it thank you thank you i could just add as well just very briefly um and there's something quite exciting happening in, in the public policy landscape. I mean, I think everybody knows uh, policy and regulation have been sort of hopelessly out of date uh, or slow to react to the digital agenda. And I think we do see, particularly with the media literacy strategy, a, a new crop of policymakers who understand what we're talking about um, and who understand it's an issue. I, I think one thing that's quite interesting from our discussions with policymakers is it begins with online harms and fake news but it then evolves quite rapidly into what are the positive opportunities of a more media and information literate society. Um, and so I think we have to, to keep both of those in, in mind that there's partly overcoming the issues of information redlining and information poverty. There's also a more general argument that says that a, an information literate society is going to be better equipped to deal with the digital challenges that are, are coming down the line at us. So we're, we're having that dialogue. We, we've recently, expanded the remit of the parliamentary or party parliamentary group uh, to include information and, and knowledge and we're going to be sharing work, the work of Mila with parliamentarians through that group uh, because that then gives us a platform to have some of those new new conversations but I think the really positive thing is there are now far more people in a policy environment who understand what you mean when you say information and understand that it's not just digital uh, and I think that's a real opportunity for us. Do we have any more questions? I think we, we did have a hand up, but it, it seems to have gone. But um, anyone, uh, is there anything in the chat? Oh, Ileana, is it? Yes. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. OK. Um, so I don't know if there's anything in the framework, but um, I was just sort of uh, thinking about uh, whether you're considering the impact of uh, 
uh, information literacy on uh, the mental health of people. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure what's in there yet, but uh, just wondering if that's been taken anywhere into account, whether it's lack of technology, whether it's whether you have access to it, but you're impacted on what you find online and probably because you're not maybe perhaps that literate, um, uh, you know, it may impact negatively on your mental health. So that kind of thing, I was just interested in that. Annalise, do you want to take that question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And mental health is something that we discussed at length when uh, developing the framework, something that we really wanted to highlight. Uh, but your points really bring in a lot, uh, a more, I think a more refined approach to mental health that we've not uh, really approached yet. So I think that this is something that we will be revisiting, but it's something that is uh, cool. So if you have a look, if you click the link and have a look, I think it is mentioned or two, two or three aspirations at least. But yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a really important in, uh, a point as well. And I know um, our, our colleague Jeff Walton has also done uh, quite a lot of work on the sort of the psychological problems associated with misinformation and things like that. So absolutely, I think me mental health is, is something really important that, that perhaps we could, well, we, we, we already do have it um, referenced not and it's not in the health literacy strand, I think specifically, I think it's in one of the other strands, isn't it, in one of the other aspirations. Yeah. Okay, well, our time is not nearly up, um, but, um, you know, we, we've been really pleased to have been um, joined by so many of you today. If I, I could also just um, sort of do a, a big thank you um, also to, to Stefan Goldstein and to Gemma Wood, who've been working frantically behind the scenes um, on, uh, the, well, Stefan particularly for the work he's doing coordinating um, Mila and the Alliance and uh, getting information out to our stakeholders, but also on the website that, that finally went live yesterday. Um, so thank you particularly to them. And um, we're really excited about where this might take us. So, you know, very, very keen to hear from people um, after today. Um, do spend some time having a look at the framework um, and send us any of your thoughts and sign up um, if you're interested in being part of the work we're doing. I think we'll uh, we can certainly just stay around for a couple of minutes um i will just stop the recording now <laughs>